Dr. Gripper, thank you so much for this interview. It's a pleasure. Dr. Gripper, you're going to be a presenter at the upcoming ASSIST conference in San Mateo from October 18 to October 20th, ASSIST standing for American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transforming Experiences. Could you tell us a bit about what you know about this upcoming conference? Well, ASSIST is a very worthwhile group in my opinion because it attempts to help people, especially professional people, make sense out of what their clients and even their neighbors and friends have what has been called spiritually transformative experiences. In other words, experiences that are a little bit out of the ordinary, but which have to do with spirit and religion, that transform a person's life, hopefully for the better, not always, but hopefully, and to make sense out of these rather than brushing them off, ignoring them, and leaving the person puzzled. I understand they can be very diverse, these experiences. These experiences can be very diverse. They can lead somebody to an act of terrorism, such as trying to blow up the Pentagon and the Twin Towers, or assassinate people that they don't like, or they can be very transformative in a positive way, bringing people to the point where they're giving up much of their fortune to help the poor and the needy, or to simply be kind and compassionate to their families and people around them. So a spiritually transformative experience, in my opinion, is ethically neutral. The effects can go either way. It can go toward hate and murder and discrimination and prejudice, or it can go through love and compassion and help and healing. I understand that uh, Stan Groff refers to the spiritually transformative experience, or STD, as spiritual emergency. There is a slight difference in meaning there. Uh, how do you interpret spiritual emergency? Well, many of these experiences are so unusual for a person and so out of the ordinary that they think they're going crazy. And indeed, they can sometimes go to a mental health professional and the mental health professionals would say, yes, you are going crazy. We need to put you on medication. We need to give you psychotherapy. Well, Dr. Groff looks upon some, not all, but some of these experiences as actually be an emergency, a crisis, that can lead to an emergence of a greater spiritual potential. And so that's why it's important that professionals know what a spiritually transformative experience is and how to separate this out from what really is a psychotic breakdown, a fit of paranoia, or something that is uh, critically in need of mental health assistance and perhaps medication. So the position of psychiatry and psychology for a very long time has been one of ignorance. Well, that has been true much of the time, especially going back to the early days of psychoanalysis, where many psychoanalysts would, and, and mental health professionals in general, would look upon these experiences as a sign of psychosis a so-called mental breakdown. But even in those early days, people like Carl Jung, who was a very distinguished psychoanalyst, saw more than that, saw many of these experiences as true opportunities for something to emerge, something that would bring a person to a higher level of individual development, a higher level of social development. So. There was an ambivalence back at the turn of the century. The strict Freudians on the one hand, and the Jungians and other people who are more spiritually inclined on the other hand. Now we can't really blame all of this on Freud himself because Freud talked about these experiences as an attempt to have an oceanic feeling, to return to the womb, to be closer to the mother. And this is not necessarily pathological. This is sort of a regression that indicates the need for some gentle guidance and help. However, some of his followers were much more radical, and they're the ones who took, shall we say, 
radical extreme measures and even today you hear of people being put on medication if they say that they've had a vision of Jesus Christ or have talked to the Buddha or have had some sort of uh, experience of the soul leaving the body and all of these are opportunities for development not for medication. Is the training that uh, ASSIST offers mental health professionals something new? This is not really new because people from the Jungian tradition have been offering this help for well over 100 years. And it wasn't only Carl Jung. You find other distinguished people in the mental health field like Roberto Assagioli from Italy who saw the opportunity for personal growth in some of these experiences. And then with the growth of humanistic and transpersonal psychology, these experiences were seen as a basic human potential, that virtually everybody has the capacity to have this type of spiritual transformative experience, if guided correctly, for the better. And that's sort of where we are at today, because more and more mental health professionals are becoming aware of these experiences and what they can teach the person experiencing them about expanding their personal horizons, expanding their opportunities for love and compassion. What is the relationship between the STE and madness? Are they on the same continuum? And, and what distinguishes one from the other? I think that this question has been very well answered by a psychologist named Richard Knoll. He took the symptoms of the spiritually transformative experience reported by shamans, medicine men, medicine women, people from indigenous communities, and listed them. And then he took signs of a psychotic breakdown, and he listed them. He tried to match them up. There was a small overlap, but I, by and large, no, they were two quite different things. So here is the problem. A very naive mental health professional, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, whatever, will hear this report and will think, this person is going crazy. And will bring out the medication, and in the old days they would bring out the electroshock. And in the even older days they'd bring out the lobotomy and sever the connection between the person's hemispheres. And, of course, not all of these were examples of transformative experiences, but sad to say, I think many of them were. Dr. David Lukoff, a psychologist, is a presenter at the conference, and his talk is titled, Recognizing the Spiritually Transformative Experience in Clinical Practice. And he says that they can be confusing for the experiencer as they challenge our view of reality. Uh, how does the experience challenge our view of reality? Well, Dr. Lukoff and his team made a very important contribution to the current edition of the Psychiatric Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. They introduced a new term, and that term was spiritual or religious conflict or difficulties. And they wrote pages upon pages upon pages. The American Psychiatric Association boiled this down to a couple of paragraphs, but at least it's in there. And it recognizes the possibility that these type of experiences could indeed lead to greater, not less, personal integration. And in those couple of paragraphs, Dr. Lukoff and his colleagues gave mental health professionals some guidelines in terms of recognizing the potential for growth within this spiritual or religious experience. So once this experience is integrated, one can actually be healthier than the normal population. But that suggests that you need a therapist who is sympathetic to these experiences and perhaps one who's had the experience himself. I think that many therapists who have had spiritually transformative experiences are more sympathetic and more knowledgeable about the experience and what it can mean. 
but not necessarily. I mean, look at all of the outstanding gynecologists, men who have never had babies, and yet they're experts on helping a woman have good prenatal health care when she's pregnant. So just because a person hasn't had the experience himself or herself doesn't mean that they cannot competently treat somebody who is bringing in an experience of seeing angels while they think they are dying, or having an out-of-body experience during prayer, or having a conversation with a saint, or talking to a power animal, a helping bird or a mammal in a dream. All of these are unusual experiences, but they can be sources of great wisdom if indeed they are handled in an appropriate way. 40% of these experiencers say that they would consider seeking out professional help in integrating the spiritually transformative experience. But many of them don't trust mental health professionals, and I think you've gone into that a bit. Uh, Freud equated mystical experience with infantile helplessness and primary narcissism, and the late psychiatrist Albert Ellis, the father of rational emotive therapy, said that spirit and soul are horseshit of the worst sort. So how did psychiatry come to this position in the early days? Well, I have to put in a word of defense for Albert Ellis because he was a close friend of mine. And the type of experience that he was talking about were from religious fundamentalists, were from people who had these experiences and used them as an excuse to malign women, to persecute homosexuals, to fight people whose religion disagreed with them, to be bashers of blacks, of Jews, of Native Americans. These actions are often the results of spiritual transformative experience. Those are the type of experiences that Dr. Ellis was talking about if you read his books carefully. Dr. Ellis had nothing against the Unitarians, the Universalists, the most varieties of Buddhism. He explains all of this in great detail in his autographical book, All Out. So you can't really make a blanket statement about Ellis because unfortunately I have to agree with him in much of what he said and we know that there have been people who have been spiritually transformed like the law student in Israel who went on and killed the Nobel Prize winner Isaac Shamir because God told him to do it. That was a spiritually transformative experience for the worse. And the people involved in terrorist attacks, whether they're Muslims or Jews or Christians who kill abortion providers, they all act from what they think is the voice of God or Allah or Jehovah or whoever, and they can do terrible things. So a spiritually transformative experience doesn't always lead to compassion and love. You mentioned earlier that Carl Jung had a spiritually transformative experience after his break with Freud. In fact, many people feel he actually experienced a, uh, several years of psychosis, but he was able to heal himself, and he treated that experience as kind of a shamanic journey in which one finds one's own personal mythology. I think you have something to say about this? Well, Finding yes, this is uh, one of the books I've co-authored, Personal Mythology, which is uh, now in its third edition, and people are able to do their own exercises from this book, available on Amazon.com, Personal Mythology by Feinstein and Krippner. And Carl Jung is often cited in that book, as is Albert Ellis, by the way, both contributed ideas to the formation of this book. And when Carl Jung broke with Sigmund Freud, he went into some very bizarre behavior patterns. But what saved him was what has become known as the Red Book. He recorded all of these visions and hallucinations and dreams, often accompanied by pictures, and worked his way through it, came out on the other side, healed and whole, and much better than he was before this break. In a way, he went through what Joseph Campbell calls the hero's journey. Yes, he did. And he brought back the wisdom of what he's learned as a boon for mankind. 
Yes. Yes, the hero's journey, for people who have not heard that term, is something that recurs time and time again in mythological literature and in people's lives today, where they start out at a given point in their lives and then they leave it physically or psychologically looking for something else, often some treasure or some insight. They find it and they bring it back and then they share it with their community. And so it's not only something that they have found for themselves, but it's something that they share and something that is a boon to the community. Now, the shamans did this all the time. The medicine men, the medicine women, the indigenous healers. This is one way that they would find resources for the community, especially if the community was running low on food and the shaman had to find out where the game was, running low on water, and the shaman had to find out where there was a spring, or maybe they were under attack by enemies and the shamans had to go out and find where the enemies were. Very practical uses of this hero's journey. And today, of course, we have other uses for hero's journey that people can go on. One of my doctoral students at Saybrook University actually did her dissertation on women who went on a hero's journey and she followed the outline in our book, Personal Mythology. These are women who were raised in a very strict Christian tradition, and it was overwhelming. They couldn't cope with it, so they left. And they left and went on their own hero's journey. They found another spiritual tradition and came back and either merged these insights with their former orientation or sort of started with something new. And she named her dissertation, Breaking the Tie That Binds, from the old hymn, you know, uh, uh, about the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Well, sometimes you have to break this and move away come from it and come back and become a better Christian and more able to love. So these hero's journeys are happening all the time, whether people know it or not. Dr. Krippner, in preparing for this interview, I learned a new phrase. I think it's iatrogenic harm. Uh, that means harm resulting from the activity of health professionals. For example, false diagnosis, absence of empathy or understanding. Uh, so how have people been harmed? C can you go into this in a bit more detail about how people have been harmed when they have one of these spiritual experiences and they're misdiagnosed? Sad to say, especially some years ago, people would come into their psychotherapist and they would say, oh, I just had the most experience, most unusual experience. I dreamed that I was talking to my Uncle Joe who died five years ago. And he said, don't mourn for me. I'm very happy in the afterlife. I'm learning new things and I have some messages for you. Well, the psychotherapist would listen carefully, make some notes, and say, well, I'm going to give you a prescription for some med medication, and this medication will work well, and you won't hear from your Uncle Joe anymore. So here we have what could have been a transformative experience nipped in the bud. So the person takes the medication, and then there are dreams, Uncle Joe trying to come back, and trying to get through. And so the patient comes back to the therapist. The therapist might say, I didn't give you the right type of medication. So five types of medication later, the person begins to develop side effects from all this medication and ends up worse than when they told the therapist about it. Now, I hope that this is not happening too often today. Back when I was first investigating these phenomena, it happened all too often. But, you know, the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the social workers were never taught about spiritually transformative experiences in their training. Now more and more they are, and they can go to seminars, they can go to workshops, they can go to books, they can read about this, and so that they're on hand to help somebody who comes in. I also have to say that I know of many people who 10, 20 years ago would bring such an experience to the therapist and the therapist would say, you're tired, you're stressed out, just take a good night's sleep and these things will go away. 
And then some therapists were simply honest and said, you know, that's an interesting experience and I don't know how to help you with it. Why don't you go to your clergyman, your pastor, your rabbi? Okay, sometimes that helped, but sometimes they would go to their pastor who said, that sounds like the work of the devil to me. It's not, it's not strictly Christian Orthodox, and I think you'd better pray for the salvation of your soul. And so sometimes going to a religious authority was iatrogenic too, produced more problems than not. As you can see, a lot of education needs to be done so that people in authority, whether they be mental health professionals or religious professionals or whatever, know that these experiences are not that unusual. They're a legacy of the human potential. They're basic to the human condition. And if guided in the right way, they can be very helpful, and make a person happier, more joyous, more optimistic, more loving, and more healthy. Well, thank God that ASSIST will be offering educational requirements and support for mental health professionals to understand the challenges and meet the needs of these people who really need to be understood. Oh yes, all the speakers at this conference will be approaching this topic from different vantage points. So the lucky professionals and semi-professionals, even non-professionals who come to the conference, will get a very deep and significant education. I understand that in a survey in 2004 by the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, they found that about 36% of U.S. adults have had at least one religious or spiritual experience that changed their lives. I'm wondering, are people nowadays increasingly involved in personal transformation? Well, this is a very famous study. The team was headed by Andrew Greeley, who is a sociologist, but also a Roman Catholic priest. And he got into a little trouble with his church as a result of the survey, by the way, because I've heard him discuss this. But nevertheless, other people have tried to repeat the survey. They've come up with the same figures, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower, but I think these figures still stand up. Yes, when people are questioned, no matter what their religious background, about one out of three, at least, say, yes, I have had a spiritual or religious experience that changed my life, hopefully for the better, and this is a description of the experience, and this is the way it's changed my life. I'd like to see more of this going on to find out if these statistics and these percentages hold up today. Are spiritually transformative experiences increasing in frequency nowadays? I don't know if they're increasing in frequency, but we certainly are hearing much more about them today. They're on Oprah and other television shows. They're in popular books. They're in interviews, and some of them are people who claim that they've been born again, and hopefully for the better, hopefully the rebirth came out better than the first birth, which isn't always the case, as I've mentioned before. Other people have been taken out of their body for reunion with loved ones or with the deity. Other people have had spirits come into their body and they have begun to talk in a different voice. They've begun to act as what we call mediums or channelers. And sometimes what they come up with is absolute drivel, absolute nonsense. But sometimes it is remarkably wise. So you can see that professionals interested in this topic have their work cut out for them. A lot of common sense is needed. A lot of discrimination is needed. And I put together a book with two colleagues of mine called The Varieties of Anomalous Experience. And this book came out in the year 2000, but it's still very current in terms of the advice it gives, because at the end of each chapter, each anomalous or strange or bizarre experience, we give guidelines for psychotherapy and differentiate this from psychopathology. In other words, when is a past life experience? a helpful experience that illuminates something that a person can put to good use, and when is it delusional that will get the person into trouble and really be the mark of an oncoming psychotic break. A good clinician really has to know the difference and has to be able to separate these things out. 
Dr. Krippner, people are experimenting more with Eastern religions and New Age disciplines. What are the pitfalls and the promises of spiritual practice these days? Well, I think there are always pitfalls when somebody leaves the tradition in which they were raised and goes to explore a very, very different tradition. Sometimes it works out very well. Sometimes, again, this is a hero's journey. Sometimes a person will leave the Western religion that they grew up with, whether it be Judaism or Islam or Christianity, and will explore Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, and one of its varieties, will find something richer here, something more meaningful to them. Fine, but this is something you don't do overnight. All of these traditions have a legacy, they have a history, they have practice like meditation, or uh, martial arts, or visualization, that go along with it, and this has to be learned, it has to be taught by a master, by a spiritual teacher, not something you can easily pick up from a book. So, again, if somebody wants to take this journey, it can be very positive for them, but they have to do it with care, and they have to be very careful that they do not end up in the hands of a cult leader, that C-U-L-T, a cult leader, who will promise them everlasting life if they commit suicide. We've had enough of that in history. Or will say, give me all of your money and you will be much happier. So those are some of the pitfalls in terms of going into an Eastern religion. But it's not only the Eastern religion. Don't forget the Southern Hemisphere, the Native American religions, the Aboriginal uh, religions of Australia. Well. The same thing goes. A person can become very enchanted with the Native American tradition and can even do an apprenticeship with a Native American medicine man or medicine woman, learn a lot. But this is not something that can be taught in a weekend workshop. I know people who have gone to a two and a half day workshop with a supposed medicine man or medicine woman and they come out saying, now I'm ashamed and now I can cure everybody's ills. Well, of course, that's just ridiculous and these people are deluding themselves. The proper type of apprenticeship takes years, it's like going to medical school, and you have to be very carefully chosen by the medicine man or medicine woman with whom you want to do the apprenticeship. Would you call these people suffering from uh, ego inflation, perhaps, who consider themselves shamans after a, after a weekend seminar? I think that this is simply ridiculous to call themselves a shaman after a weekend seminar. And any shaman worth his or her salt will agree with that. The problem is many people offering these workshops are highly suspect. One needs to look them up on the internet, go to Wikipedia, see what Wikipedia says about them, and find out if they have been honored by an indigenous community. There is no shaman without a community. The shamans who I have known, the authentic shamans from many different continents, all are community-based. Something happened when they were very young that the community decided it was a sign of their shamanism and began to apprentice them to a master shaman, whether it was in South Africa or South America or Australia, and they took the step-by-step -step procedures and the rituals that would help them to be of proper guidance. Guidance when people were sick, guidance when people were dying, guidance when people were having conflict with their family members. Yes, these are all things that authentic indigenous leaders will do.